everyone. How are you doing today? Doing okay? I don't know about you, um, but this was a hard week. It was a week where things felt a little bit darker. My 
heart felt heavier, um, seeing what's a, coming across the news, the reminder how broken this world is, how much heartache, how much darkness we have to live in. And that, though, is why it is so, so important to have these moments where we can come together, where we can remember that the reality we often see around us, it's not the only reality. That there is still a God who is good, who is on the throne, who has a plan. And it's because of him and it's because of what Jesus has done. And because his tomb is empty, that even when this world feels dark, we know that there is hope and there is resurrection power and that anything is possible through God. So I hope you feel that hope this morning. If this is your very first time joining us, whether here um, in person or online, extra special welcome to you. We are glad to have you joining us today. And you can stop at our VIP table at the Connect Center when you leave today. There's someone there who can answer any of your questions. They have a gift for you also. And there's a few things I just wanted to make you aware of that are, is coming up. One, you might have seen that big hot air balloon out on the plaza, and that because we are in full steam ahead, getting ready for Breakaway Kids Camp in June. And we have had such an amazing turnout. All our volunteer positions are filled. We have a great team ready for camp. And we still have room for more kiddos. And so if you want to save $20 per kid on that registration, be sure to jump on graceplace.org and get your kids signed up before June 1 because price increase happens on June 1st. Another thing coming up in June, on June 12, our women's tables will be opening up. And these are small groups. Um, that meet at different times, different days of the week, and those are going to be opening up June 12th. So ladies, if you want to get plugged into a small group community, you can get on our website and check those out there as well. And all of these things happen because of your faithfulness and your generosity through the local church here at Grace Place. And so On the screen, you'll see the different ways we have to give if you'd like to jump on board with giving through the ministry that happens here. So let's continue in our time of worship, opening our hearts to what the Holy Spirit has for us today.
Thank you so much for being the rock of ages, the same God you were then as you are now. You can do miracles here today, Lord, we just thank you for that, and we love your constant and steady love, and we're so grateful. That's why we're here this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can have a seat, and we got a video coming your way. Good morning, Grace Place. Glad you're here on a Memorial Day holiday weekend. And uh, we recognize those who have paid significant price for our freedom, especially those that gave their life. We honor them on this weekend. It's so good to be with you. And one thing I'm really excited about is that I feel like God really provided quickly for us as we went on a search for a youth pastor. And, and Sam and his wife, Josie, have accepted our call, and they are packing this weekend out in Chicago, so eager to move out here, and uh, Sam wanted to say hi to you, so watch this. Good morning, Grace Place. It is so good to meet you guys. My name is Sam. I am privileged and honored to come on board with an amazing staff team and group of volunteers as the new youth pastor uh, at Grace Place. I'm, I'm really excited to be out there with you guys. My wife and I we are Colorado natives. Uh, we moved out to Chicago this uh, last year and we're excited to come back home. In fact, it's very foggy today. We cannot wait for sunshine again. Uh, but yeah, we are excited to be in town uh, in time for a breakaway. Super pumped about that. Um, everything is looking amazing. God's been opening some crazy doors for us to get out there in time and continues to open doors. Now we're just praying for the transition process as we look for a house and continue to look for a job uh, for my beautiful, amazing wife, Josie. Uh, if you guys could just join us in prayer with that, we cannot wait to be a part of the Grace Place family. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your prayers already. Uh, we cannot wait to be out there with you guys. See you soon. Isn't that exciting? And I, <clears throat> I, I hope you will put this on your prayer list, please, because uh, she needs a job. He has a job here. She needs a job so they can try to afford a house, which is not easy in Colorado these days. And so please do remember them in your prayers. So here we are in week number six of an eight-part series called Directions for the Journey, Eight Values to Keep Us All on the Right Road. And there they are. That's a picture from the wall up in our office where these values are displayed. These are Grace Place staff values. Stay fit, open hand, raving fan, work together, grit it out, empower others, make it better, live generously. And we, uh, contemplating this series, said, you know, these are all based on biblical principles. Why don't we share this with the church? And this will probably, you know, be applicable for individual lives, families, 
team environments in work and other environments. And also, more than that, we would like for you who count this as your church home, as your church family, to think of yourself as a part of an extended staff team as we align together to reach people outside the walls for Jesus. And these are values that will keep us on the right path together and on the same path. So today we're going to look at this one, open hand. And here's how it reads, staff value number six, possessiveness favors the individual. Stewardship forwards the vision. We will be flexible and adaptable, vision-focused team players, always offering our best with a loose grip. This means we're going to stay open-handed. The best teams are like that. They're open-handed. They're flexible. They're adaptable. They're willing to change. They're willing to wear a different hat or take a different seat on the bus. They want what's best for the team, not just themselves. And so they're willing to let go of some responsibilities to see others flourish, willing to embrace change. Uh, <clears throat> there are two associate pastors here at Grace Place that serve with me on the directional team, and they are um, Hollis and Kelly. And they have both been on staff for 13 years, and I thought of them as a good example of this value when I was uh, working on this message this week, because both of them over the years have had multiple titles, multiple roles. So much so that I doubt Hollis can even remember all the titles he's had. <laughs> and, and if you ask him, his preferred title is Pastor of Kingdom Mischief. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> they are examples of this value, keep an open hand. Um, in each of these, we have a different road sign that we've been featuring. And this one, share the road with cars, bicycles, walkers. I don't know how many of you uh, drive on the country roads around here, but if you go south towards Boulder, Selena and I like to take some scenic back roads to Boulder sometimes. There's lots of cyclists. Any of you a cyclist in here? Yeah, there was a lot of them in the last service. We got a few. Uh, <clears throat> we, gotta, we gotta share, not hoard the road, right? Because sometimes there'll be a whole peloton of cyclists. And sometimes there's two side by side, and then there's two coming this direction, and there's two cars on these little roads. We've got to be careful to share the road and not hog the road. Willing to share is the idea of this open-handed value. In fact, look at this scripture. The Apostle Paul says this in Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 18, command those who are rich. Now, some of you just checked out right there because you said, that's for somebody else. That's not for me. I'm not rich. Well, keep in mind, if you live here, you are rich compared to most people in the world. A lot of people are living on a few dollars a day. So this applies to all of us. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. God wants you to enjoy life. Did you know that? As long as you have the right spirit, spirit and mentality about your possessions and your money. And that's uh, explained in the next verse here. It says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. When you are generous and willing to be sh and share, then you don't have to feel guilty if you have some, some things that you like in your life for enjoyment. You know, maybe it's your, your car or your motorcycle or going golfing or whatever, going on a vacation or going on a boat. Sometimes people feel guilty about that stuff. <clears throat> but you don't have to feel guilty if you are being generous and willing to share. You know, that's the key to living a life of enjoyment the way God wants you to. So we're going to talk about what it means to be willing to share in this value of keep an open hand. Now, uh, a few years ago, Pastor Josh Ferris, who was on staff then, came to me and said, I feel like God's calling me to plant a church. And we had conversations around that. We had prayer around that. We, he, he went through a couple formal assessment processes before it was, we uh, felt confirmation of that call. And I felt like God was saying, Clay, keep an open hand. Let him recruit whoever he wants. And that's a little scary. But I'll be honest. I thought, what if they all go? <laughs> what if half the church goes? What, what's going to happen? But, but I, I felt like God was convicting me that we needed this mantra and this posture. The mantra was faith, not fear. And I kept repeating that every time we talked about the church plant. I said, if you want to go with Josh, go with Josh. The rest of us, here's our attitude, faith, not fear. And here's our posture, open-handed, not close-handed. Some of you remember that. And why do we want to be in this posture, not this posture? Well, we believe that when we choose this posture, 
God will bless us individually and as a church because we're willing to live generously and be open-handed. God blesses those who are willing to be a blessing. Now, when you choose to live with an open hand, get ready for some adventure. <laughs> who likes adventure? Anybody? Come on, you all like adventure. We just all like different types of adventure. We don't all like the same thing, but God created us to enjoy different kinds of adventure. And I want you to know that following Jesus is more than just believing the right thing, going to church, reading your Bible, and prayer. Those are all important things. But following Jesus is joining him in adventure. Because I love travel and adventure, I also love maps. And uh, we have, if you go over to the outpost building where our children's ministry is, you'll see on the wall a big map there of Colorado back in 1871. And it's fun to look at it because you can see what's on there and what's not on there. Bertha and Loveland aren't even on there yet. And, you know, all the actions happening up here in the mountains where they're finding gold in 1871. And they're still wrestling with Native Americans on who gets what land and all that stuff. But if you haven't been in there, you should go see that. There's a big old canoe with a light in it that's hanging up over that. If you go to my office, you'll see a huge map of the world on, on the side of one of the, my walls. And I just love studying it. I look at it every day. I think about places I've been, places I want to go. I think about missions. I pray for our churches in Mexico City, in Ecuador, and in Peru. And for mission people that I'm involved with in Ukraine and in India. And, and I just love studying maps. Last week I was studying a map with some buddies of, of Wyoming. We're going to ride motorcycles across dirt roads of my, Wyoming. And so we're studying the map there. I love maps because for me they represent exploration and adventure. Now, have you noticed something interesting about your Bible? A lot of you are reading your Bible on, on a, your phone or iPad, and that's great. I do that too. But <clears throat> if, you, if you grab a print version of the Bible and you go to the back, what do you find? Maps. There's all of these maps in the back. Why? The early followers of Jesus understood that they were commissioned to take the gospel to the world. And so the Apostle Paul and others teamed up, and they went on several missionary adventures. And the Apostle Paul made plans... But then he kept an open hand because he was sensitive to the divine interruptions and redirections. And we're going to see several examples of this. See, Paul's ultimate goal was to go to Rome. He talked about it a lot. It was the capital of the empire. There was no more influential place to plant the church for Jesus than Rome. But it took him a while to get there because God had some other plans and redirected him several times. After Paul's conversion, he became single-minded in his passion for the gospel, determined to keep the main thing the main thing, and to reach as many as possible for Christ. The very first missionary journey is here on the screen. It started in Antioch over here. And we read about that church, a lot of positive stuff. Some churches are more healthy and some are less healthy. This was a very healthy church in Antioch because they were mission-minded. They, they were externally focused. They weren't about themselves. They're the kind of church we want to be. And, they, and as a result, they, they were ascending church. And, and, and they laid hands on Paul and Barnabas in Acts 13. And they said, we're sending you on a church planting adventure. We want you to come back and tell us about it someday. And we don't know for sure, <clears throat> but I believe the first place Paul was headed was Rome. That he planned to stop right here first in Cyprus and then get back on a ship and go to Rome. We don't know, but just from all I've read about all the times he talked about Rome, I think it's likely. But something happened when he got here to Cyprus. When he got over here to Pamphus, he, God divinely connected him with the governor, the proconsul. His name was Sergius Paulus. Sergius Paulus. And, and through a series of miracles and events and preaching the gospel, the governor of all of Cyprus became a believer, a follower of Jesus. And I learned something really interesting recently on a trip to Turkey with a well-known archaeologist, Dr. Mark Fairchild. Um, where he goes from here is straight up to another Antioch. This is off, often called Pisidian Antioch because of the region. It's not to be confused with the sending church in this Antioch in Syria. Paul diverts his course and goes straight up there next. Why? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I think this is an example of keeping an open hand. 
And we learn this not from the Bible, but from archaeology. I mentioned I traveled with uh, Dr. Mark Fairchild. There's a picture of him and some other pastors earlier this year on an archaeological uh, tour of the seven churches of, of that are written about in Revelation that are all in Turkey. And you can still visit those locations today. And I learned from him something fascinating. By the way, if you want to know more about him, watch the documentary called The Last Apostle on Amazon Prime. Fascinating. It's all about Paul's travels through Turkey, and, and he's an expert on it. Very, very fascinating guy. I love him. And in fact, we're talking right now about getting him here as a guest speaker. We're just trying to find a date that works for him and for us. But what he, he told me is that archaeologists have discovered through inscriptions that this guy, Sergius Paulus, was actually from this Antioch. This is his hometown before he had been sent to be a, a, you know, a Roman governor down here in Cyprus. And so it seems likely that he convinced Paul and his traveling associates to alter their plans and go up here to tell his family and his friends and his city the good news of the gospel. Now, here's what's interesting about that. This may explain why John Mark left the team right here. They sailed to here, and he left the team and went back to Jerusalem. Paul was not happy about that. He deserted them. Why? Well, right here are some serious mountains, and these mountains are difficult to navigate, especially in those days, you know, tiny little passes and, and trails, and what made it even worse is that it was filled with bandits, pirates, who used to be pirates on the sea, and they decided, you know what, there's some places up here where it's really easy to sabotage people and rob them, and so there were bandits all in these mountains. And, and, and in fact, Paul had to face some difficult things. I mean, climbing mountains and fording, fording rivers where they didn't have bridges sometimes and, and risks along the way, danger. In fact, look what he says in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits. There you go. In danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. Danger, danger, danger. You talk about adventure. By the way, you can't really have adventure without some danger once in a while. <laughs> but, but, but man, he, he was on an adventure, no doubt. And, and so they, they get to this spot, and here they are. They got the mountains and the bandits to go through. And John Mark says, not me. I signed up to sail to Rome. I didn't sign up to climb dangerous mountains and ford rivers and get robbed by bandits. I'm out of here. Peace out. And he goes to Jerusalem. Paul eventually forgave him, but it took some time. John Mark was not willing to have an open hand. But as a result of Paul following the promptings of the Holy Spirit, the gospel spread and churches all over Galatia were birthed and many, many, many came to faith. In fact, it says in Acts 13, 49, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. Acts 14, there are various adventures, many converts, and after Paul established all those churches, he and Barnabas traveled backwards the other direction to, to go back and to encourage all the believers that they'd left behind. And they went all the way back to Antioch, the sending church, to give a report. And in verse 27, it says, On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Now, I want you to notice a very key phrase here because it's tied to what we're talking about. And that is, not on that screen, this thing's kind of fun if you can figure out how to use it. Notice this. God, that's he, had, say it with me, opened a door. You see, this is a theme of how God often directs us if we are sensitive to, the, to him and to his spirit with open doors and closed doors. But we've got to be sensitive to the spirit if we're going to allow, if we're going to have an open hand, hold our plans loosely. The door had closed to Rome. That was a good plan. He, he'll get there eventually, but it's not when he thought, and not like he thought, as we'll see in a minute. 
But when the door closed to Rome, guess what? The door opened to Galatia. And so it's good to make plans. The Bible has a lot to say about the value of making plans. But if we're, if we're going to be spirit-led, we've got to hold them with a loose grip and stay open-handed to the fact that God may redirect. So Paul gets back to Jerusalem. After he goes to Antioch, he goes to Jerusalem. He hears that false teachers are confusing the converts and trying to bring them under the law of Moses and putting an unnecessary burden on his converts in Galatia. So he... he with great passion, pins the missive that we now call Galatians. He wrote a letter to them about how the gospel is about Christ plus nothing, not Christ plus Moses. And then in Acts 15, he probably wrote that between Acts 14 and, and 15. And then in Acts 15, we have the famous Jerusalem Council, where all the leaders got together prayerfully and sought the Lord about the Gentiles. Should they be, have to be circumcised and come all under the law of Moses or not? And they decided, no, they did not. And they concluded, Paul might not have even had to write, written Galatians if that would have already happened, but they came to that conclusion. Now look what happens at the end of, Galatia, of, uh, excuse me, of Acts 15. Uh, it says, at the end of the Jerusalem council, Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now, notice that their first, this is the second missionary trip they're about to go on, and their initial plan is just to revisit the churches they already planted. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it was wise to take him. Why? Because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So chapter 16 tells us that Paul and Silas, his new traveling uh, partner, they pick up Timothy, a young pastor along the way, a, a new adventure companion. Paul never went by himself. He was always in a team. Now watch the, this example. This is a classic example of God redirecting through open and closed doors and how we must keep an open hand. Okay, this is Acts 16 beginning with verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of, of Pergia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word to the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Now, two times we're told the Spirit kind of redirected them. I don't know how that happened. Circumstances, promptings, we don't know, but they were sensitive. So they passed by uh, Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready. We, now Luke is traveling with them too. <laughs> this is kind of subtle details. You notice reading Acts, all this, whenever it says we, it, Luke has joined the team too. He's the, the author of Acts. We got ready at once to leave for Macedonia concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. As soon as they're clear on where God wants them to do, go, it says they, they leave immediately at once because they want to be obedient. And, and that's how all of us want to be if we're followers of, of Jesus. Now, now, Paul was always willing to alter his plans and change the agenda when prompted by God. And as a result, the gospel goes to Europe for the first time. And that's what we see here in the second missionary journey. Here's where Paul received the vision, and he was planning to turn around like he had done before and head back to Antioch after he encouraged all these churches. This is the region of Galatia here, but he now is being called by a man from Macedonia. This, this part of northern Greece is still called uh, Macedonia today, and so this, this is Asia, and this is Europe, and right here is in Istanbul, by the way, right here, and Istanbul is the only city that's on two continents because part there's a bridge and lots of ferries, but part of it is in Europe and part of it is in Asia. So they come over here to Philippi, the first city they come to. It's a Roman colony in Greece, 
And uh, Paul's normal strategy is to go into the Jewish synagogue until they won't have him there anymore, which in some places was very quickly. And then he would go to try to share the gospel with Gentiles. Well, apparently there was no synagogue in Philippi. We haven't found archaeological evidence of it. And when he gets there, instead of going to the synagogue, he asks around, he finds out there's a group of believers in the true God of heaven, not yet Christians, but influenced by the Hebrew scriptures, who are meeting by a river just outside the city. And one of them is a very prominent businesswoman, a seller of purple named Lydia. She receives the gospel. She's baptized. She has a lot of influence. Everybody that knows her gets baptized. They start a new church in her house. And that's the first church in Europe. It was all because he obeyed God's prompting and kept an open hand. We were on a Footsteps of the Apostles trip last fall, and just so happened we went out for a little teaching by that same river that's right by the archaeological dig. It's only one river. It's, we know what river it is. And, we, and one of our travelers had not been baptized, and it was a spontaneous thing, but it was so fun. Watch this. We had a baptism right there. Baptized you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 <laughs> Voice because we would do that whenever there's baptisms and the next baptism is happening here on June 26. If you're not baptized, we're going to make some noise for you when you get baptized on June 26. Let us know. Go on the website. So everywhere the apostles went, they boldly proclaimed the gospel. And guess what? There was always a result, either a riot or a revival. Sometimes both. Read the book of Acts. It's just fascinating to read the adventures of Acts. And if we keep reading in Acts 16, we learn that there was a riot that happened because Paul cast out an evil spirit from a fortune teller who was following him and shouting when he preached and harassing him. And so he set her free. He delivered her from a demon. And her slave owners, she was a slave, and the owners were mad because they were making money off her as a fortune teller. And now their, their money dried up because she could no longer do what she was doing with demonic help. And, and so they dragged Paul and Silas before the magistrate. Now, <clears throat> when I was touring the ruins of, of Philippi, um, I found the very spot where this happened. And it might not be interesting to a lot of people because it just looks like a bunch of rubble. But once I, I, I was um, instructed by an archeologist what it was, I found it pretty interesting. Watch this. This was the stairs up to the bima, the judgment seat. That's a Greek word used for the judgment seat of Christ also. But in the forum, here's the Roman forum. There was a raised up platform for the magistrate to address the crowd. And so this is probably the place where Paul was brought, Paul and Silas, before they were thrown in prison. And here's where a fence was located to keep people back, keep the crowds back from this raised up platform where the magistrates would address the were brought, and then they were, they, it was determined that they would be beaten and thrown into jail. They believe they've actually found the jail, by the way. It says prison of St. Paul right there. And so here they are. They're sitting in a jail with their feet in stocks. Their backs are bleeding. They're, they're far from home. They're just trying to do God's work, and they get this unfair treatment. What'd they do? Did they moan and complain? Did they get mad at God? Did they say, why? Why did you do this to me? That we're so prone to do that when, when things go wrong for us. We're like, why God? And, and nothing like this has happened to most of us. This is bad. I don't know if you've ever sat in prison with your back bleeding your feet in stocks for something you didn't do or something you did that was good. But what did they do? They sang praises to God. Why? Because they were keeping an open hand. They knew they were, like the Blues Brothers, they were on a mission for God. <laughs> and and, and, and they, they, they said, we're going to keep an open hand because we know God's going to use this somehow. Can't see it now. It's all dark. It's all, it doesn't seem fair, but God's going to use it. And God showed up and saved them, and not just them, but the jailer and all his family and household. And that guy probably wouldn't have been saved if that hadn't happened because they were willing to have an open hand and see God show up miraculously. 
So we're talking now about the second missionary journey where they come into Europe and they plant churches in Thessalonica. They don't stay there long. They get run out of town, death threats. They go to Berea. They're welcomed there by people who be become believers. They go to Athens. Paul goes on to the, you know, the, the, up by the Acropolis to this day. There's a place called Mars Hill where the, he reasoned with the philosophers in Acts 17, went to the wild a rowdy city of Corinth, planted a church there, went to Ephesus, planted a significant church, Rhodes, and on back. That was a second missionary journey, an adventure all the way. You can read those stories about proclaiming the gospel, planting churches, riots and revivals, adventure everywhere. Paul didn't rest too long before he felt like it's time to go back and, and make some believers and encourage some believers. And here's a map of his third trip. Now, on this trip, he went back to all the places where he'd planted churches to encourage them. But when he came to Ephesus, he stayed there for two years. This was uncharacteristic. Usually, he's, he gets a church going. He gets some pastors trained up. He lays hands on them, and he trusts them. And he sends them a letter later to encourage them. And he's on to the next place. Got to reach as many as possible for Jesus. But in this case, he stays in Ephesus for two years. Now, major, Ephesus was a major city in those days, a port city, a lot of commerce, and a lot of people coming from all over the area to shop and do business. And so there was a place of influence for the sake of the gospel. Now, today, Ephesus is an amazing archaeological dig that you can visit. I've been to a lot of them and never one as impressive as Ephesus. Um, I was here again this year, and behind me, you see this iconic library that they've <laughs> Uh, re-erected up from the, 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 under the rubble that they found. It's, and it's just one of many, many examples that are impressive in Ephesus. Well, when Paul gets there in Acts 19, it says he entered the synagogue, that's his standard operation, spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way, which is Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And some of his followers initially were called the way. So Paul left them, he took the disciples with him, and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia, the whole region, heard the word of the Lord. How could that happen? Well, many of them were traveling there, and they heard about what was going on, and they, he was every day teaching in this rented lecture hall for two years, and then they took the, they received Jesus and took the the word home. But Paul was not just doing evangelism. He was also training and commissioning new church planters who were then sent out into the whole region. And that's how the gospel was spreading so rapidly. Now, Paul's time in Ephesus ended suddenly due to another riot. And his determination to keep an open hand and watch for opening and closing doors. And here's how you know that you're facing major op opposition. If a theater that holds more than ball arena down there, where the Avs play, by the way, first time in 20 years making it to the Western Conference Finals. Any Avs fans here? I should have, should have thrown that in first service. Wait, wait, here's how you know you're facing opposition when a packed theater that holds more than ball arena is filled with people that hate you. Now, I want you to listen to Dr. Fairchild tell the story. It's from the latter part of Acts 19. And I'm going to play this rather than tell it myself because he is standing in that huge theater where that riot happened in Ephesus. Watch this. Over here. In the Agora, that's where Demetrius and the silversmiths would have rose up against the Christians. As they claim, Christians were asserting that gods made with hands are no gods at all. And that's a disgrace to Artemis, the great goddess of Ephesus and the goddess who is honored to walk around the world. But I think a bigger problem was that uh, it was cutting into the pocketbook because so many people in Ephesus had become Christian that they were no longer buying their little token statuettes that they were selling to people who came. And uh, so as a consequence, they seized two of Paul's disciples, Gaius and Aristarchus, who were trained in the school of Tyrannus and had uh, 
of course, been doing ministry out and around Asia to other villages, cities, and towns. And they dragged him into this theater, and uh, they were intending to do harm to them. When Paul heard about it, he rushed to the theater. Now, the city was a massive city, 350,000 people. So they probably couldn't locate Paul, or they may have arrested Paul and dragged him into the theater. But instead, they got two of his disciples. So Paul rushed to the theater when he heard the riot was taking place. And he was met by Asiarchs. Asiarchs are rulers of Asia, uh, some of whom had become Christians. And they prevented Paul from entering into the theater, realizing that he might be killed. And then instead, the Asiarchs came into the theater and addressed the people, saying, we are a Roman city. We have to abide by Roman law. What is happening here is a riot, and we can't have it. And as a consequence, the whole operation was broken up. Then, from that moment, and this is part of Paul's strategy as well, he realizes that once a disturbance breaks out into a city, that that's a sign from God that it's time to move on. And it's at this point that Paul takes off from here and continues with the latter parts of the third missionary journey. The larger your assignment from God, the more likely there's going to be opposition. And Paul often experienced that. But he learned to pick his battles. He learned to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and, and so that he might know when to stay and fight and when to move on, when to avoid a place, when to return to a place where he'd been persecuted, or when to hide out. As you're reading through the book of Acts, and it's so exciting as you, as you, it's just movement, movement, movement. As you get to the end, all of a sudden, it just seems like it's not over, but it stops. It's an unfinished book. After three missionary journeys, Paul headed to Jerusalem. There he was falsely accused. He was arrested. He faced five trials. He sat in a jail for quite a while. And he finally, because he was also a Roman soldier, appealed to Caesar, which was the right of any Roman soldier who didn't feel like they were getting a fair trial. And because of that, he finally was taken to Rome, but this time as a prisoner. And sometimes we call this the fourth missionary journey. And this map has all, all the missionary journeys on here with different colors. But uh, even though he was going forcibly, he wanted to go to Rome anyway, and when he got there, he preached for Jesus. So we'll call this his fourth journey, and they, they encountered a huge storm here, ended up shipwrecked and had to swim to survive to a little island of Malta here, and uh, was able to preach the gospel there as a result. And then they made it their way finally to Rome. And Paul spends two years on house arrest there, preaching in Rome. By the way, so many people ask us after we led a footsteps to the apostles trip, Selene and I last fall, to do another one, that we've planned another one for June of next year. And uh, if you're interested, after this message, go immediately to the glass conference room by the fireplace, and Selene will be there with details to tell you about this amazing trip. We're going to go to Athens, we're going to go to Corinth. We're going to go to Ephesus. We're going to go to Patmos, where Paul, or where John rather, wrote Revelation. Go to the Grotto of St. John. It's so moving. We're going to go to Santorini out here because it has no biblical significance, but it's the most amazing place on the planet. And then we're going to end it here in Rome for a few days. And we're going to see the burial sites actually here in Ephesus of John and here of both Peter and of Paul, and I'll be doing teaching along the way. It's going to be an amazing adventure. But f Paul finally made it to Rome, where he'd been longing to go, not the way he intended, but still on a mission for God. And here's how the book of Acts ends. These are the last two verses of Acts. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Now there's something interesting to note here. Look at the way the book ends. Isn't that kind of a strange way to end? Where's verse 32? Where's the next chapter? The book of Acts is an unfinished book. It just ends suddenly. Why didn't Luke finish the story? Why didn't he tell us that Paul was later set free? 
that he traveled for more than four years through Asia Minor, visiting beloved converts. He might have even made it to Spain as he had hoped. Why isn't it recorded that Paul later returned to Rome, how he was rearrested, this time treated as a criminal, not in a, a, under house arrest, but languishing in a damp dungeon where he would write Timothy and call him my beloved son in the Lord, probably kept in the Mamertine prison that's just off of the Roman Forum, a few blocks from the Colosseum, which you can visit today. Where's the tra chapter about how he was tried and condemned and beheaded and buried outside the city, where you can today go to the Basilica of St. Paul's outside the city, and his tomb is there. Why isn't the story of Paul concluded? The reason, I believe, is that the book of Acts is not the story of Paul. <laughs> It is the story of Holy Spirit revival, the spread of the gospel, the growth of the church, and the story is not yet over. We're still writing chapters of that. In fact, in some of your Bibles, it says the Acts of the Apostles. That's not in the original manuscripts. It just says Acts. It could just as well be the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And the book is still being written. It's unfinished. Franz Schubert's symphony number eight is called the Unfinished Symphony because it had only three parts instead of the traditional four movements. The book of Acts is like that. It can be called the unfinished book because the story goes on. The Christian church is still alive. The Holy Spirit is still bringing revival. Christians are still sharing their faith. Lives are still being changed. The gospel is spreading around the world person by person. When will the book of Acts be finished? When will the last chapter and verse be finally written? Only our Heavenly Father knows. But maybe it's partly up to us. Because Jesus said this. He said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Can you think of a solitary thing that is more important than participating in this endeavor, this adventure of letting others know the good news? You know, it is so easy and so normal and natural to just be quiet and enjoy our own security in Christ. Forget about the rest of the world, that's their problem. Oh, how Jesus, who shed his blood for sinners, must long for us to quit being ashamed. Ashamed to speak up for him when we have an opportunity. Oh, how he who suffered the sinner's death for every man, woman, and child must long for us to have the same attitude of the faithful apostle Paul when he said in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Not ashamed. Because it is a power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, first the Jew and then for the Gentile. Not ashamed, he says. Not ashamed of the gospel. And that's it. this is written in a day and age when to speak for Jesus meant that you may be mocked, threatened, abused, stoned, beaten, imprisoned, crucified, or beheaded. And such was the case with Paul. A little more risk factor than most of us should expect this week if we have a chance to share the gospel, in this culture anyway. Nevertheless, Paul was driven by one thing that mattered most, and I love this passage, Acts 20. He's speaking to the elders of, of Ephesus before he went to Jerusalem and was arrested, and they're crying. They're all crying because they think they're not going to see him again. And he says, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Wow, that's inspiring to me. Finishing the race, completing the task was more important than life for Paul. In our old building downtown, when we first moved in there, uh, we wrote all over the stage, Bible verses, prayers, promises, and right where the podium would sit, I wrote, and then I did it again here. We all came in here, we wrote across the front of this stage, we wrote across that wall when it was in the drywall phase, and right there, once again, I wrote this verse, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task that Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. I want that to be true. I want to follow that example. I want to testify to the gospel of God's grace. I want to watch for opportunities that God gives me and respond. I want to keep an open hand. How about you? Amen? Let's pray.
Father in heaven, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for the ultimate adventure rescue mission, Jesus, at the cross and through the tomb. Thank you for the implications and applications to us. And thank you for forgiving us of our sins when we confess them and for, for taking us into your family when we receive the gospel. If there's anybody listening to my voice in the room, online, podcasting, who has not yet said yes to Jesus, I pray that they would have the courage right now as your Holy Spirit prompts them to just open up their hands and open up their heart and say, yes, Jesus, be my Savior, be my Lord, forgive me for my sins, take me into your eternal family. And for the rest of us, Lord, may we be conscious of your promptings through the Holy Spirit. May we be watchful of open and closed doors. May we keep an open hand as we seek to collaborate with you in your kingdom adventure. In Jesus' name, amen. It's been great to worship with you guys. There's prayer partners right back here. God bless you all. Go in peace.